Chagrin, Jam Masters. Eventually, you get enough clarity to realize that what we call working on yourself and growing spiritually, going to God, are exactly the same thing. They're exactly the same thing. I mean, not even like they get along together. They are the same thing. If you have a helium balloon with a gondola under it, and it's on the ground, tethered by ropes and stakes in the ground, but it's filled with hot air, it's filled with helium, whatever, its natural state is to rise. You don't need to do anything to make it so that it will rise. There's a reason it's not rising. And that reason is not because it's not its natural state. Its natural state is to go up. The reason it's not going up is because it's anchored. It's tethered. It's tied to something that doesn't allow it to go up. Some people make the gross mistake of thinking spirituality is about putting more helium in the balloon. Somehow getting it to go up, to want to go up. And others come to the deep realization that it's about cutting the tethers. It's about cutting the ropes that are binding it to the ground. If you cut the ropes that are binding to the ground, it's not like that's your first step. Now there's another step you must do. If you cut the ropes that are binding to the ground, you do nothing. It goes up by itself. That is the truth of life and of the spiritual path. There is a reason that one is not experiencing the unity, the oneness with all things. And there's a really, really good reason for that. And until you deal with the reason, you're wasting your time trying to have spiritual experiences or trying to meditate deep enough to touch something that's beyond yourself because you'll never hold it. It'll be some experience that you had. So real growth, real spirituality, is about cutting the tethers, cutting the ties, releasing the anchor. But that's the kind of work that's not so romantic. People don't want to do it. But nowadays, it's beautiful. People are starting to do that work. So what is tying us down so that we can't ascend, so that we don't feel the natural force lifting us up? And the answer is very simple. We are. It is not anything else that is doing it. It is a literal, willful act that every one of us are doing to bind ourselves and tie ourselves down so we don't go up. So that's why it's awful funny when you say, I want to know God. Well, that's a lie. That's like saying, I want to go up, but you're holding on to the anchors that are keeping you down. I'm not used to say it this way. I want to want to go up. It's a big difference, okay? I want to want to, right? Now, why are we doing that? Why are we doing that? Why would we do that? The answer is because at the core of your being, not at the deepest core, at the deepest core it's ready to go up, it's up, it's beautiful. But when you drop into the body, when the self, the consciousness, the awareness of being drops into the body, it loses itself. It gets disoriented. It doesn't know itself as itself. It gets amnesia. When people get amnesia, they're scared to death when they come to. It's a terribly uncomfortable situation to not know who you are, who your family is, where your house is, anything about your... I mean, that'd be pretty freaky, wouldn't it? That's what happens. And that is what's going on inside of you. So deepest at the core, not back to the self, to the Atman, to the clarity, to the consciousness, but the moment the consciousness drops in, there's total disorientation. All right, now what? You try to get oriented. It's literally at a panic level. It's at a survival level. How do you try to get oriented? Interestingly enough, there is stuff coming in front of you. You've dropped into this body and the senses are picking up the world that's unfolding in front of you. So it comes in. That is your first experience of something other than yourself. You're the consciousness, the awareness, now it's what are you conscious of? And I'm not going to go into it too deeply, but it's something you should, someday you'll experience what I'm talking about. So what you do, you, the indwelling being, the consciousness, the awareness of being, is you start to cling, to hold on to these objects that are passing through your consciousness. 
because you're not looking back up to where you came from, to the nature of your own being, what is the source of your consciousness. You're looking out because that's what happens when you drop down and get bound. And so these objects of consciousness, your mother, your father, your crib, your house, are coming into your awareness of being. At the same time, you're panicked to try to find out who you are, to define yourself, to not be lost. And so it is absolutely natural, and it will happen every single time, that you, the consciousness, I'm talking about you in there, hi, you in there? You will grab those objects that are external to you, You are the consciousness that is aware of those things, but they are closest to you. They have come in and they're manifesting inside your mind. You will start to grab those and define yourself based on the experiences you're having. That is as deep as it comes. I gave a talk the other day at the university and it was entitled Where Psychology and Spirituality Touch, Merge, Where They Meet. This is really where they meet. We didn't go that deep in that talk. Talk a little deeper here. Literally, this is where psychology comes from. This is where your ego comes from. This is where your self-concept comes from. This is where all of that inner noise, I talk about that voice in your head, that's where it all comes from. It has nothing to do with you. You are the consciousness, the awareness of being. But because there's this sense of disorientation, this sense of lostness, this need to define oneself, you grab onto the objects that are closest to you, and those objects happen to be mental. They don't start off being mental. They start off being outside objects. But outside objects come in. You see them in your mind. I've already been through that with you. You understand that? You're not really looking out here. That's very important. You're not looking out here. What is happening is light is bouncing off of the objects out here, reflecting off of them, hitting your your receptors, and being sent back through your optical nerves and rendering inside your mind. Right now, when you look at me, you are not looking at me. It is the same as when I watch a TV. I'm not really watching the ball game. The ball game is way over there in San Francisco. But it's being picked up, digitized, sent through the wires, and then rendering on my TV screen, and I'm watching the rendering. That is what's happening right now. You are not looking outside. Outside is coming in, and you are looking inside. Okay? It's pretty far out, isn't it? Things are not what they appear to be, are they? Nothing is. So you have learned depth perception. Your mind is brilliant. You've learned depth perception. You've learned all kinds of things. It's very important. You see how beautiful spirituality rests on top of truth, physics, science. There's nothing different about it. But we don't live that way. Most people have no idea that what I said is what's going on. So basically, light bounces off the objects outside. It stimulates the receptors, your optical sensors. It gets digitized, not digitized, but in a sense, turned into impulses, electrical impulses, gets sent up your nervous system, and then renders in your mind. So right now, look at me. Look, it's in there. You're looking in there. I know you don't feel like you are, but you are looking in there, right? And I can prove it to you. Close your eyes, then it can't come in turn off the lights, then it can't bounce. (laughs) It's so true that it seems stupid to say. It is not that when you turn off the lights, you can't see. It is that when you turn off the lights, the wavelength of the electromagnetic spectrum that your senses are able to pick up is not there. So the point is, it's all coming in. You are watching it inside. So when you first are born, when you first drop down onto this plane, hi, welcome, The first thing you experience is what's going on outside coming in and it's passing before your consciousness. You're just, whoa, and you don't know who you are and it scares the hell out of you. If you're in amnesia, you don't even know what's going on, everything scares you because you don't know how to relate to it. You don't know how to relate to things, do you? What happens with new things? You get scared. And anything, what happens if somebody doesn't behave the way you expected them to behave? You get scared. What happens with somebody who you don't like, they've always been an enemy for five years, you never said a nice word to it, all of a sudden walks up and says, oh, I like you so much. You're scared. You need to be able to relate to the objects that are unfolding in front of you. Otherwise, you get scared. I'm telling you why. That's the root. It's because you're disoriented. You're not centered comfortably within the self, within your sense of being, Therefore, you are trying to define yourself by these objects that you see. And if I ask you, I do this in the book, if I ask you who you are, you say, I'm 
Peter Barry. Well, you're not Peter Barry. It's a collection of letters that somebody gave you. <laughs> you're not a name. Okay, I'm so-and-so's wife. Very good. Who were you before you met him? You didn't exist? You're not somebody's wife. You're not a name. You're not the person who lives at 1522 Southwest 12th. Because if you move, you're still you. You're not a 23-year-old girl or woman. Why? Because someday you'll be 35 and it'll still be you. You are you. You're not what's happened to you. You're not what's passing in front of you. You are the person who experienced what's happened to you. You are the person who's experiencing what's happening to you. Do you see the difference? But that's not how we live. And the reason we don't live like that is because we're scared. Can anybody relate to being scared in there? Hi. Scared is not the right word. If you let go of all the protection mechanisms that you've built around and all the things you've clung to and pulled around you and said, yes, I am such and such a wife and I'm this person's parent and I'm this and I'm that and I'm 25 years old and I'm attractive and people like me, keep going, keep going. Oh, and I live over here and I won such and such an award and I'm good at music and on and on and on, okay? And I say, how are you doing? You say, fine. Okay, what if I take all those things away? What if somebody walks up to you? You didn't win that award. I won that award. No, yes, I did. I won it. What if the... The house disappears. I like, it's not that it burns down, that's too easy. It's that you drive home, you take a turn, you go and you pull up and the house is not there. Not that it's not there, it's an empty lot. There's no empty lot and there never was such a house. How you doing? <laughs> I'm serious. I, I swear to God, if you're willing to sit through this, I like you. Pay attention to why it's so hard. I'm going to try to show you how to have a beautiful life. It can't be beautiful when you're doing this. Why? Because you're saying, I'm really not okay. I'm pretty panicked. I don't understand who I am or my relationship with anything. And the way I get to be okay is to define these relationships and hold them in place and say, this is what's going on. And as long as that's what's going on, I'm relatively okay. And the moment it's not going on, I'm not okay. And if it's really not going on, I'm really not okay. And if I even think that it might not go on, I get scared. That's not a spiritual life. That's a life of a lie. You are defining yourself as things that pass through your consciousness. I'm telling you, that's not who you are ever. A light that's shining on things is not the thing it's shining on. It's just illuminating the thing. If you move something else in front of it, it'll shine on that. Move something else, it'll shine on that. So if the light beam, if the light identifies with what it's shining on, and you try to take the thing away, I'm dying, oh my God. No, you're not dying. <laughs> the object is moving. The light doesn't change one iota. Your consciousness has nothing to do with what it's aware of. If I hold pictures in front of you, one after another, the pictures change, you don't. I get, hey, one picture, two pictures, three pictures, and you say, yeah, I saw that, yeah, I saw that. Who did? Who saw that? Because the pictures are different, but you're not, are you? You who saw them are the same. You are the consciousness that is seeing the picture. It's the same you who sees all the pictures. You know you saw them. It's the same you who sees your dreams as you who looks out through your eyes. You wake up in the morning, you say, I had a dream last night. How do you know? If you weren't there, you wouldn't know. Were you the one who watched your dream? It's even deeper. You wake up and you say, I didn't dream last night. I went so deep. It was so peaceful. How do you know? How do you know? Because you are the consciousness, the awareness of being. Were you in there when you were 10? Did you have thoughts when you were 10? Did you have feelings when you were 10? Did you see things when you were 10? How do you know? Because you're still there. When you were 10 and you looked at a mirror, you looked out your eyes at a mirror, did your body look like it does now? No. Was it you who looked? Don't think about it. It's intuitive. There's only one of you in there. There are lots of thoughts. There are lots of objects that have got passed by. There's lots of feelings. But you're the same one who feels all of them. If you come to me and you say, Oh my God, since my friend left, my husband left, my person left, my heart hurts. I'm going to ask you a very simple question. How do you know? How do you know? Because you are the conscious being that is aware of the feelings that are coming out of your heart. Not because you are your heart. You don't even use the words. You say, my heart hurts. Who's this my that has a heart? My finger hurts. Who is this who has a finger? 
It's so intuitive, it's ridiculous. You are in there, and you have been in there from the beginning. And you're the consciousness. You are not even related to the objects that are passing in front of you. Like I said, if I hold a picture and take it down, you don't die. The picture just went away. You're still there knowing you saw a picture, and now it's not there. So that's what's meant by self. That's what's meant by Atman. That's what's meant by soul. That is the core of your being. You, the indwelling being, the end user, the one who lives in there. That is what spirituality is all about. Yogananda called it self-realization. You realize who you are. But you can't now. Why? Because you have tied yourself to an anchor. What anchor? These objects have passed through your mind since you were young, and you clung to some of them, not all of them. I always tell you, you didn't cling to the white lines that pass by when you're driving, but you clung to some stuff, didn't you? <laughs> stuff that had an impression on you. You had a neat car when you were in high school. You were that kind of a person, right, with a sports car, whatever it was, right? You see that car now, 10 years later, you get all excited, don't you? You hung on to things. I'm the one that had the neat car. I'm the one that had this experience. Do you understand that? And you start building this model of yourself. Psychology calls it a self-concept. The self-concept is not the self. It's a concept of the self. It's a thought pattern. So you hold on. The bottom line is the reason you do it is because you're scared. You're disoriented. And so you start to, what is called clinging. You start to cling to or grab objects that are passing through your consciousness, through your mind, and you hold on to them and you build them in your mind. And you actually held on to a number of experiences, quite a number, that you've had in your past, and now you define yourself as that person. And what happens is you're in trouble if you do that. Everybody does it, don't feel bad, but I'm here to tell you, you're in big trouble if you do that. Why? Because if I build this model of who I am, everybody better agree. (laughs) Do you understand that? Because it's almost as though I'm putting myself up for sale every time I open my mouth, every time I get dressed, every time I go somewhere, every time I meet somebody, right? Because if I've made up that this is the person I am and people don't relate to me that way, they don't treat me that way, they don't talk to me that way, it doesn't feel very good at all. It's not very supportive, is it? So what we end up doing is saying, this is what I've defined myself as. If you agree, you're my friend. If you really agree, you could be my spouse. (laughs) But you have to sign on the line that you'll always support me. Like if we're in a discussion at a party and we're with our friends and I say something that turns out to be pretty stupid, it was wrong, right? You support me. Otherwise, when we come home, you hear the discussion. Why didn't you support me? That's ridiculous. You left me out. But darling, you were wrong. I don't care. Ooh. You know anything about this? It is happening because you have put a shield in front of yourself, called your self-concept, clung to it, and said, as long as this is acceptable, I'm okay. The moment anything outside does not gel or match, even the slightest thing, really the slightest thing, and we get upset. We get weird. It gets uncomfortable inside. Come on. It's just so funny. It's so funny. It's embarrassing to even talk about. So what I want to explain to you is that discomfort you feel inside when somebody doesn't agree with you, when somebody doesn't say what you thought they'd say, when something isn't unfolding the way you thought it would, whatever it is, that basically you get uncomfortable. That discomfort that you feel inside is really the legacy the vibration of that original panic of I don't know who I am, I need to define myself in a sense of panic, and then you grab onto things. When the things don't support you, you fall back a little bit into that fear, into that insecurity, into that sense of lostness. Let me ask you a question, and don't answer me. Has it ever totally fallen apart on you? If you ever had some enough things happen outside, usually it's someone you love leaving you or something like that or dying, something happening that is so against your self-concept, so different than what you anticipated or expected that the inside collapses and you, you almost like don't know who you are anymore and you don't know how to relate to anybody, yes or no. That's everything I'm talking about. 
I know you don't want to experience that. I'm sure you don't even like talking about it. I want you to see where it comes from, and I want you to see where spirituality and psychology touch. It is consciousness, awareness, soul, Atman, spirit, descended God that gets lost when it drops into the body. It doesn't know itself as itself. It doesn't know its divine roots. It's just consciousness that's aware of what's going on in front of it. It's very confusing. And so it starts to cling. It starts to hold on. And you do it your entire life, not just when you're a baby. All right? You cling to all these things and you build this model. But behind it is why you're doing that. And that's the discomfort of not knowing yourself, of not knowing who you are. All right? At some point in your life, not most people's lives, but you guys are special. Some people wake up. They wake up and realize, this isn't very much fun. (laughs) I'm tired of being scared. I'm tired of worrying about everything I say. I'm tired of worrying about what my hair looks like. I'm tired of worrying about whether I put the right clothes on that match that everybody else is wearing. I'm tired about worrying about the fact that I burped. I'm tired about the fact of worrying about that my hair might get gray and then what people don't like me. I'm tired of worrying about whether people that they're at where they said they were at or they're lying to me or what's going to happen. Blah, 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 blah. You just get tired of it. I get tired of it. I don't want to live like that. You wake up and you realize we're all sitting on this tiny little planet a tiny planet, this little piece of dirt spinning around the middle of nowhere being neurotic. <laughs> Worrying about every single thing. How often do you have a conversation with somebody? Normal conversation. You give your opinion, they give their opinion, you say something, what you like, blah, blah. blah. Normal conversation. You walk away. Is that conversation over? <laughs> no, that conversation is not over. They keep going on in your stupid head. If I should have said this. Oh, my God. I should, why did I say that? Oh, my God. One day, I hope you don't misunderstand what I said. I was like, should I call him? No, 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 don't call him. <laughs> Is that just me or anybody else got that going on there? <laughs> I'm trying to show you why. I'm literally showing you why that goes on. People sometimes say to me, why does that voice in your head talk so much? Because you told it to. You, the consciousness, the awareness of being, has gotten lost and has tried to define itself in what is not itself. It's trying to define itself in all these past experiences that it liked or didn't like. You define yourself as, I'm the person who got the best part in Wizard of Oz in the fifth grade, and I played Dorothy, right? You define yourself as your good experiences, and you define yourself as the person who their husband, he left them and ran off with their best friend. That's who I am. You define yourself as these experiences that you weren't able to handle, and you clung to them either because you liked them or you didn't like them, so you pushed them away, and you end up building this whole world inside of your head based upon these tiny little experiences you've had, and I'm telling you, you are completely invested in that. And so now you have to go out and sell yourself. I remember the first time I was 22, 23 years old when I saw this, is. I don't want to go around the rest of my life selling myself every time I walk out the door. I remember clearly, like I was in a 7-Eleven and I was buying something. I mean, I was, I was even traveling. I was like in Alabama or something. I wasn't even, and I was by myself. And I went up to pay for something and I dropped the quarter, dropped some change. And I went down to pick it up and he was so embarrassed. He wasn't, they weren't even sure he wanted to buy the thing. He wanted to just leave the store. What, are you kidding me? Are you serious? That you're going to be like that for the rest of your life, that you can't handle anything because you might look weird or something like that? And so I decided, no, 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 no. (laughs) If I have but one life to live and it's on this tiny little ball of dirt spinning in the middle of nowhere and I'm going to die, I came down, I'm going to leave, I am going to learn to have fun. I am not going to define that I'm okay because everybody agrees with what I defined and nothing better disagree. After What do you think worry is? Worry is that things won't be the way you think they need to be or that they will be the way you don't want them to be. What else is there to worry about? And you worry a lot and you will worry for the rest of your life. You will waste your life serving this maniac, which is the self-concept that you built to hide yourself. Somebody once asked Yogananda, What is the ego? There's an enlightened being. You get to hear an amazing question they asked him. What is the ego? Master, what is the ego? He said, the masquerading self. In other words, you're the self. He fully knows, he's realized, you're the self, and you pulled this around yourself like a mask, this concept of yourself, and you're hiding inside of it, aren't you? There are people that if they live in a subdivision, 
and some weed grows up in the grass on the front lawn, they're embarrassed. They don't want the neighbors to see. If the house needs painting, if the house is not as nice as the remodel that happened next door, it gets uncomfortable, doesn't it? Everything makes you uncomfortable. Everything is a a problem. It could be a problem. You don't want to live like that because then you have to go out there and try to make everything be the way you think it needs to be for you to be okay. I'm going to repeat that. You have to go out there every minute of every day and try to make everything, every person, play, even the rain. It should rain when you want it to rain, and it shouldn't rain when you don't want it to rain. You have trouble with the weather. You have trouble with people. You have trouble with everything. And you're going to for the rest of your life unless you do something about it. You check your parents out. Check your grandparents out. You just have trouble with different stuff. But it's going to be the same thing. If you're not okay inside and you define a world based on your past experiences and how you define yourself, you define a world that has to be a certain way, and then you go out there and try to be okay by making everybody and everything be the way you want, oh my God, I feel so sorry for you. Do you know what the probability is that you will get the moments unfolding in front of you to be the way you want? Zero. The moments that are unfolding in front of you have causes. They have reasons that they are the way they are. Hundreds of billions of influences have come together over time and space, and they coalesce together and create the moment in front of you. It has nothing to do with what you want or not want. What did they sell you? (laughs) A bill of goods that everything should be the way you want, and if you're, you're doing something wrong, if it's not, come on, use your will, affirm. Are you crazy? If you sit there and tell me right now you've never been to Paris, and there's a restaurant over in Paris that you've never been to, and you decide that what I want them to serve as a special tonight is something, right? What is the probability that they're going to serve that because you said you wanted it to be? Zero. That's the probability of every single moment that unfolds in front of you, whether it's in Paris or here, being the way you decided you wanted it to be. Why would it be? Things are the way they are because of the forces that cause them to be that way. There's physics, there's chemistry, there's the weather is the way it is because of meteorology. It's just so funny, it's unbelievable. So the moment in front of you, I'm telling you, is no different than every other moment. There are moments that are the way they are because of the influences and forces that came before them that caused them to be that way. That's why every moment is the way it is. Not just the moment in front of you, the moment to your right, to your left, above, below, Mars, Saturn. So there's nothing special about this moment unfolding in front of you. It's not yours. You're just experiencing a moment that's unfolding in the universe. Moments are unfolding every single place in the universe, aren't they? Why is the moment in front of you different than every other moment? It's not. It's just that you want it to be. You would say, well, it's different because I don't have a way I want the other moments to be. Okay, good. Congratulations. Because that is the only difference. That you have made up how this moment that's unfolding in front of you should rain or shouldn't rain. You should be nice, don't sit so close to her. Don't wear that color because my brother wore that color when he died. Blah, 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 blah. And you just make up all this garbage inside your head based on your concepts from the past. And then you try to superimpose them on top of the moments happening in front of you. Well, it ain't going to work. There's no way that's going to work. You're going to be a nervous wreck. Because you have built inside of your cute little mind a concept of how things need to be for you to be okay. And now there's a real world unfolding out there. That'll make anybody anxious. It might not be the way I want. They might be talking about me not nicely. Anything might happen. I might get up to give my talk in front of the class. They might laugh at me. I mean, anything could happen. And so the next thing you know, you're a neurotic mess. Next thing you have all this anxiety. Because the only way you're going to be okay is if everything, every moment unfolding in front of you matches this concept you built inside. But the moments don't stay still, do they? There's always a new one every single second. If you understand nothing else, do you see why I'm saying it can't be the way you want? I'm not cursing you or anything. It is not possible that every moment that happens to unfold in front of you is going to be what you made up based on your past experiences. The moment in front of you has nothing to do with your past experiences. It has to do with science. It has to do with the forces that cause it to be the way it is. Your past experiences are inside your head. You just made up something in your head and you stepped into reality that has nothing to do with you and you're right, it's wrong. We do it all the time. So at some point, you wake up and you realize that's the anchor. That's the anchor. While you're doing that and then you're out there manipulating, controlling and fighting and worrying with the unfolding of reality, your make-believe fighting reality, 
you are tethered. You are tied every moment of your life. You're going to be scared. Every once in a while, something happens that's nice. What does it mean nice? It matches what you wanted. You're nice. He freaks out over. And you're nice today. You might have freaked out over yesterday. Just some different things happened, so you were more open to it. It has nothing to do with what's happening outside. It has to do with how what's happening outside matches what you built inside. There's no right or wrong or good or bad or any of that kind of stuff. There's a world unfolding based upon the forces that make it be the way it is. You happen to be looking in a certain direction, that's the part you see. Look somewhere else, you see another part. The question is, how does that part match that you made up about how everything needs to be for you to be okay? And you don't call it how it needs to be for me to be okay. You say how it should be, how it's supposed to be. And then you come there and you suffer. That's what Buddha says suffering was. You suffer because you have a way you want it to be. That was the second noble truth. The cause of suffering is desire. The cause of suffering is you have made up a way the world needs to be for you to be okay. And it's not behaving, is it? <laughs> it's not being a good world. It's not behaving itself. People aren't saying what you want to hear. They're not doing what you want to do. Blah, blah, blah. That causes anxiety and trouble. And I taught you why it does that. And we're talking very deep. It causes anxiety and suffering and trouble because behind your psyche, you're scared. That's why you pull the veil around you. If you pull a shield and live in an armored place, there's a reason you did that, because you're scared. If I start taking down the shield or the armor, you freak out, because there's a reason. If you think you're so bold and, no, I'm not scared anymore. I carry 15 Uzis with me. Okay, fine, I understand. No, I've been scared since I do that. Okay, we'll take those away. Ah, I don't know. There's a reason you're doing what you're doing. There's a reason you built this self-concept. There's a reason you worry so much. There's a reason you're so anxious. There's a reason that you need things to be a certain way. And that reason is you're not okay in there. And so you built all this in order to hide, in order to be okay. What spirituality says is if you continue going out there doing that, you will suffer for the rest of your life. You will always have problems. Even if you have something that's nice, you'll be afraid of losing it. There is no peace for that kind of life. Plus, the terrible thing is the world keeps changing. Every moment, there's another moment. And so it never gets comfortable. All right, so what do we do about that? Is there something you can do about it? The answer is yes. Yes, you can learn to be okay inside. Not give the psyche what it wants. Not avoid what it says it doesn't want. That's a game. If you play that game, you lose. You'll do it your entire life, and you don't ever get satisfied or for any period of time. So the question is, what is the root of all this? I explained that to you. The root of all this is you're scared to death in there. <laughs> the root of all this is why you're maintaining that self-concept, why you need things to be the way you need, because otherwise it gets really freaky in there. It gets scary. Believe it or not, the short answer is this, learn to get comfortable with that. That's the other life. The other life says, yes, if you take away my Uzis and all my armor stuff, I get scared to death. I have two choices. Try to get the stuff back or work with that fear. I don't want to build my life on top of that fear. I want to learn to work with myself so that I can deal with that fear, so that I can work on my way through that fear. That is literally the difference between a worldly life, a person who's forced to go out there and make everything be the way they want and never not be the way they don't want, and a spiritual life, a person who is saying, my work is to work on myself, to learn to come into harmony with these vibrations and these feelings, no matter how uncomfortable they are, to learn to get comfortable with them and work my way through them so I can find myself back to my being, so I'm not lost anymore. That's what it means. And when you do that, you will find God. You will find what all the great masters found. You will find what Christ taught. You will find what Buddha taught. You will find what Muhammad taught. You will find that you are somebody very, very great in there. And the fact that you have to work your way through this discomfort and fear, that stuff that doesn't know who you are, and you start looking back to find yourself instead of looking out into your mind. And that is the essence of spirituality. And the more you do that, the more you get more and more comfortable, and the hilarious part of it is, the more you start to realize you're not only okay, you're the most beautiful thing ever walked the face of the earth. Who? 
you in there, you in there. So there's you, the self, the Atman, the consciousness, and then there's this layer of fear, of lostness, and then there's this whole psyche you built in front of that layer to try to be okay even though you feel the lostness and the fear. That's it. The answer is to work your way through that layer of discomfort to be able to come back to the nature of your true being. The, the yoga teachings, we teach that one of the names for God, one of the names for the soul is Satchitananda. Satchitananda, eternal conscious ecstasy. Someday I want to know that you are going to touch that part of your being and you will remember this talk and you realize you're the most beautiful thing ever walked the face of the earth. You don't have a single problem. You will never have a single problem. You do not need anyone or anything. You have reached a state where you're feeling nothing but love, joy, light, upliftment, beauty. That is what's going on inside of you. Basically, you're fine. You're whole. You're complete. You found your way back to the core of your being, which happens to be the most beautiful thing there is. It says in the Bible, man was created in the image of God. That's what it's talking about. You will touch parts of your being that you realize are so expansive and beautiful, they have nothing to do with your humanness. What a human is, is God lost. It drops down and builds all this garbage. If you let go of that, I'm going to talk to you how to do that. If you make the meaning and purpose of your life, you have a choice, is the meaning and purpose of your life to manipulate and control the moment in front of you so you feel more comfortable with it and so it doesn't betray you and freak you out so you have to deal with that discomfort in there, or is the meaning of your life to work your way back to the core of your being so you undid the reason for the rest of this. The ego falls off, just falls off. You no longer have problems with what people say. And people sit there and say, but, but why would you behave properly if you don't have all the fear and the social anxiety? If you are fine inside, I guarantee you're going to be fine outside. If you don't need anything from another person, you're not going to mistreat them. Why would you? You're fine. So the answer is not to build this psyche with all these superegos and concepts and all this junk. It's to free yourself completely back to the core of your being where you're always being fed love, joy, light. Then come out and deal with the world. Nobody's saying you don't deal with the world, but you don't deal with it from the point of view that it has to be the way I need it to be. Otherwise, I'm not okay. You deal with the world from the point of view as I'm fine, I feel love. I feel joy. There's nothing else I could ever need. It's so beautiful inside. What I'm saying, take the most beautiful it's ever been inside. And I guarantee it happened because things were the way you wanted. (laughs) You got everything exactly the way you wanted for what, one second, right? And you just got high, didn't you? It's like, wow. It's like exciting. And oh my God. Like people with the lottery, they get all excited, (laughs) right? Or you fall in love with your wedding day and it's the first kiss. And there's some high stuff in there. You see a beautiful sunset that's so, everything's just right. It blows you away. Take that, multiply times a million and have it going on all the time. And nothing can ever take it away. And you know, I want you to know that nothing can ever take it away. You can leave it by getting involved in the garbage. I don't know why you would. Over time, you never will. And you'll realize that if I don't leave it, nothing can take it away. Everything is just passing before me. If I can handle that, then I get to stay in the bliss, in the ecstasy, in the high state. Now how do I deal with the world? Now when you come into the world, you don't need anything. You're fine. You're happy. You're filled with love. So you end up not taking things from the moment unfolding in front of you, not manipulating and needing things from the moment unfolding in front of you. You actually help and serve the moments in front of you. It's a totally natural thing. If I don't need anything from you and I'm not afraid of you and you're in front of me, that's the moment in front of me, it's more like, well, what can I do to help? I'm doing fine. That's called compassion. I'm doing fine. Can I lend a hand? Would you do it and want something back? I don't need anything. It's not like, I'm going to renounce the fruits of my action. You can't even imagine anything that you could get from outside that would ever create anything close to what's already going on inside of you. That sounds a little different than the garbage down here, doesn't it? So you can either wallow in the garbage and try to make everything be the way your self-concept says it has to be, good luck, or do the work that's necessary to work your way through that layer of discomfort instead of trying to protect yourself from it by manipulating the world. All right, so I hope you hear me. And I'm talking about 
you get uncomfortable. You know that. You get uncomfortable and you've gotten uncomfortable. I am telling you that you, the consciousness, are capable of handling the discomfort perfectly comfortably. And if you can handle it, it's not scary anymore. There are people that are scared to death of snakes. There are people that pick them up. I'm not telling you have to learn to pick up snakes, but I'll tell you right now, if I lived in a place where there were snakes and I was scared to death all the time, I want to learn to be comfortable with them. I'd rather learn to be comfortable with them than try to move and not be able to handle my environment. So inside, you're going to find out on a daily basis, no, on a moment-to-moment basis, that the world hits your stuff. Have you noticed? I give you the example I give you all the time. Somebody's driving in front of you. So funny. I tease her all the time, and it starts happening to me all the time. Literally, just the other day, someone is driving exactly 15 miles an hour below the speed limit, and I'm behind them, and I'm thinking of my talk. You could deserve it. You give this talk all the time. (laughs) (laughs) Somebody's driving 15 miles an hour below the speed limit, and there you are, and you can't pass. It's a double line. It's traffic coming, and then there you are. It creates discomfort. You get uncomfortable about the stupidest thing in the world. You're driving, and when you get to the place you're going, which is like 20 minutes away and miles and miles away, you have to carry some things out, and it starts drizzling where you are now. It gets uncomfortable. Your mind starts getting a little anxious, doesn't it? Those are the ones I want. Don't worry about the big ones. Don't worry about the big ones. Don't worry about what freaks you out completely, right? I want the tiny little ones that happen every moment of every day. It's just absolutely unbelievable how often that happens, right? That you get this little sense of discomfort, right? I want you to practice, learn. I know it's not natural. I want you to learn to be comfortable with that discomfort. I want you to make it a game. It's a video game, just like the kids play the video games, okay? They have fun. They get up to level six, they come all the way down, they laugh, and they go do it again, right? That's how I want you to be about the stuff inside of you. I want you to play with it. I want you to say, I am going to learn to handle these little things that are uncomfortable. How do you handle it? By literally, if you can handle something, you don't have to do anything about it. I don't need to do anything about the fact that the person in front of me is driving 15 miles an hour below the speed limit. If I can't pass them, there's nothing I can do. Am I okay that there's nothing I can do? Am I okay that this is the situation that I'm in? The natural tendency is it's not what I want, therefore I'm not okay. And it'll create that discomfort, right? Relax. Relax. You in there practice relaxing in the face of the little tiny discomforts that everyday life creates. And do it more, and do it more, and do it all the time. Remember to do it all the time. Wait till you see what happens to your life. What will happen is all of a sudden these little things that used to create discomfort, and then you got all uncomfortable about the discomfort, and you told people about it, and you thought about it later, and it ruined your day because somebody was driving too slow in front of you. All of a sudden it just comes and goes, like it should. It just comes and goes, right? Big deal. Something is not the way you want. Oh, you poor little thing. (laughs) It's just there's going to be constant situations, constant, that cause you a disturbance. Things that you can't do anything about. There's just moments that are passing by. I am begging you to do the work that is necessary to get comfortable with the fact that you got a little bit uncomfortable. Because then what it will do is it will pass through. And you will learn how to let things pass. You'll learn how to, what do I do if he gets uncomfortable? Things make him uncomfortable, right? I look at him, take a breath, and let him go. I just let it go like you would a child or something like that. I'm not going to invest myself in my discomfort. I'm not going to invest myself in my discomfort. I'm going to learn to release it. As you do that, you actually learn. You're capable of learning. You learn all kinds of things. Learn this. Learn to handle yourself. Learn to be comfortable when he or she, whoever's in there, gets uncomfortable. Because you're going to see it does it all the time. Just relax through it. Then all of a sudden, something bigger will happen. And because you learned how to handle the smaller one, you won't realize that you're able to handle the bigger one. And then eventually, your significant other says, you know, I've been having some trouble. I want to talk tonight. And they say it in the morning on your way to work. That's not nice. And all of a sudden, you can handle it. All of a sudden, you look at it, it goes like this. It's okay, we'll talk tonight. And you let it go, and it goes. It doesn't stay in there. It doesn't ruin your day. 
and you actually come home, and all of a sudden, your significant other is sitting there, she had some great day, or had some great day, and got a raise, and said, I thought you went, no, 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 I'm sorry, I was just in a bad mood, and you would have ruined your whole day worrying about what was going to happen that night, wouldn't you? Wouldn't it be nice to be able to let it go, and be able to deal with things healthily? You are capable of doing that, but it means you work your way through the discomfort instead of devoting yourself to the discomfort, devoting yourself to doing something so the discomfort is not bothering you. Let me repeat that because that's the essence of spirituality. Instead of devoting all of your will and your intelligence, your energy to figuring out how not to feel this discomfort or make it go away when I feel it or blame somebody or make sure it never happens again, whatever the heck it is, that's called devoting your life to the lowest part of your being. You devoted your life to your discomfort. Instead, you look at the discomfort and you say, I can handle you. I can handle that you exist. I can handle there's white lines on the road. I can handle cars drive by. I can handle that this feeling came up inside. And you just, I'm telling you, you relax and you lean away from it. Relax, R&R, relax and release. You just relax inside, relax. If you need to do mantra, do mantra. I told you, you can just count. If you're not into spiritual stuff, just count. One, two, three, four. That is healthier than, oh, why did he do this? I wish he would drive faster. One, two, three, four. Really, you have the right to do these things. You've never exercised that right. You let the reaction to the discomfort run your life. I told you, you look forward to going to a party. You buy a dress or a shirt or something to wear, and you're all excited, and you go there, and you get to the party, and all of a sudden, your mind says, he sees something, something. You know, Sally's over there, and you had a little argument with her last week. And all of a sudden, the mind says, I don't want to see Sally. I really don't. I didn't like what she said. I'm not comfortable with it. It hurt me. I'm out of here. I don't want to be. And you actually leave. Oh, that's so embarrassing. You actually leave. That's unbelievable. You let the lowest part of your being run your life. Don't worry. Everyone else does too. Why? Why? That's ridiculous. Wouldn't it be nice to say, oh, there's Sally. Well, we'll see what happens this time. You can go about your business. And then have a nice time. How in the world can you let the fact that you had a little spat with Sally a week ago ruin this evening? No, no. Don't you dare let the lowest part of your being run your life. So what you learn to do is to say, I'm glad Sally's here and I'm glad it hit my stuff and I'm glad that discomfort's coming up because it's practice time. I'm going to practice letting it go because that's what I'm about. I'm about letting go and handling that garbage. I don't mind that it's there, it's there, it's real, but I can handle it. I'm not going to devote my life to it. So you relax your way through it. You relax your way through it. You just relax, lean back. Like I said, you need to count, do mantra, breathe, but don't get involved in it. Don't give yourself to it. Relax through it. And then something bigger will happen. And next thing you know, you start feeling this joy that you never felt before. That's because you're not devoting yourself to the lowest part of your being. You're not hanging out with all these disturbed parts of your being. And all of a sudden you'll realize that you're getting higher. That's cutting. I started off by talking about the gondola with the hot air balloon. You're starting to cut the tethers. It's so neat. I talked about something very deep. Remember I said it's tethered down? Why does it not go up by itself? And I said I would teach you what the tether was. I did, didn't I? You are the tether. I said that, didn't I? I said, you're it. You are holding yourself down because you can't handle yourself. And so now you have to control and manipulate everybody because you can't handle yourself. Handle yourself. Learn to handle yourself. Use every single situation that used to make you freak out, that used to make you say weird things, that used to make you lie. Use it instead to let go. Don't suppress. Don't push it down. Welcome it. It's there. But I can handle this. It's like wind in your face. Some people can't handle wind in their face. They get all upset with the wind. They hold their hair down. I don't want to mess up, right? Some people love the wind blowing through their face. I like it. This is that. If you're the kind of person that can't handle these little weird things that come up inside of you, learn to enjoy them. Learn to let them just be energy that's blowing past the wind. It's just wind blowing. As you learn to let go, more and more energy is liberated from playing at that level. Like, how much energy is being expended by that garbage coming up and then you fighting with it and then you going out there to manipulate everybody else to say they're sorry for what they said and better not see them again? You are wasting tremendous amounts of Shakti. 
tremendous amounts of energy. When you stop doing that, all that energy comes up. When I told you that the nature of self is such an ananda, it's pure joy rushing up inside of you, that's the energy that creates the joy. Right? It's just the most amazing thing in the world. So you need to learn to free yourself. That's what untethering your soul is. That's what the entire thing is about. If you do that work, you're doing the same thing as spiritual work, if it's a real spiritual work. So do you see that? I said they were the same thing, didn't I? And if you do the other and try to have a weekend experience or have this or that, it'll just be an experience you had. Oh, once I had this saw light, it was so beautiful. I went into a tunnel. Okay, well, what about now? No, 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 I sleep, man. <laughs> hear me you do this work and every state you reach becomes your permanent state you become established I I don't want you going up and coming back down it's a constant every day you grow every day you get higher and eventually when you wake up in the morning you'll wake up and sheer ecstasy will be pouring through your veins wave upon wave why? because that's where you were when you left here you went through your subconscious which is nothing left in it there's just joy and beauty because you allowed life to be that you didn't suppress all this stuff and hold it the reason you suppress things is because you can't handle them you don't suppress everything you just suppress the things you can't handle go ask psychology they'll tell you that what's a traumatic experience something you really really couldn't handle and don't even like to think about because it was that bad well what's a not a traumatic experience something that happened that you could handle it's not the experience it's your resistance to it once you can handle yourself and handle the different vibrations, your subconscious will cleanse. And the next thing you know is you pass from waking state down into sleeping state and back, there won't be all this mess. When you wake up in the morning now, a lot of people have bad yickies. That's because the subconscious opened. And what's down there comes back up and you start feeling that. Instead, you'll feel joy and love and ecstasy. That's where I want you to be. Not much. I don't want much for you. I just want you to feel love, joy, and ecstasy every single moment of your life so that when you interact with everything else, you don't need a single thing and you're just, in essence, seeing, can I be of assistance? Can I be of help? I told you, the people say, your parents say to you, what's your career? What do you want to do with your career? What's the meaning of your life? You have to give some purpose and meaning of your life. Here's the meaning of your life. Here's the meaning of my life, that every single moment that passes before me is better off because it did. How's that for a purpose of life? That every single moment person, place, thing, animal, roach, doesn't matter. Every moment that passes before me is raised because I could help it. I could serve it. I could raise it. It's always something I can do. I don't have to think about it. So you do that, wait till you see what happens. All of life just becomes absolutely beautiful. It runs after you. It's very good. hope you understand these things, mostly about that fear in there. Now you understand everybody has it. And it's deep. You go real deep in meditation Sunday, you have to face that, right? Because it won't let you go further. Until you say, okay, fine. And you just relax your way through it, no matter how hot it is. And once you go to the other side, it's over. Jackative.